time. Well, we'll keep going until they figure it out. I'm waiting for Godot. How, how do you build this? So great companies are not launched. I, I keep... Um, I keep getting disappointed with companies that come out in the New York Times or the BBC or the Financial Times and launch. Hi, Graham. Come on up here and grab one of the microphones. How do you, uh, when, when a company launches like that, Color is a great example that's blowing up right now in the, in the tech right. press from that's San Francisco. Right. Yep. And they launched. They were not built. When Instagram came out, they, they didn't launch. They didn't. I didn't yeah. see it for the first time in the New York Times. I saw it. Yeah. I saw it like downstairs, yeah. at a picnic table with two guys at it, mm -hmm. and that shows that this dream can happen for any two guys or two girls, right? <clears throat> how do you build that story, what, and and how do you build it cross border, yeah. you know, to build a worldwide brand? Well, I think the story is really important. If I have kind of one um, thing that we harp on about at Ariadne when we when we talk to the companies that we do is if you're we say if you're going to own a market you've got to say that you're going to own it if you're going to do something like build the mobile banking ecosystem you can't be shy about it um, so I think however you do it and there's lots of different ways but I think that you have to uh, you know how do you get leverage as an entrepreneur by it, using technology by finance and communications and I think where, where companies fail it's because they've missed out one of the three they're not using tech they're not using finance and they're not using communications so you've met Julie already and have an idea of why she's up here um, Graham I, I, I love because you know in the old world uh, entrepreneurs believed well Mark Zuckerberg told me this right he said I moved Facebook from Boston to San Francisco because that's where I had to go to build my business. That's where the money was, that's where the talent was, that's where the PR was, and all that stuff. And that's where you had to go to build a tech company. He now says he's probably wrong about that. And I think he looks at you, because you built a company that's not in San Francisco, right? You built Rackspace, and it's a multi-billion dollar public company. How did you do that outside of uh, the San Francisco area? Well, I think one of the keys is to become a, pla a, a great place to work. Um, you have to, uh, a company, any company that is, most large companies don't grow very fast. And so uh, the hiring problem, I think, is, is, can be managed a little bit better. But when, that is, we've added 80 to 100 people every month for oh, many years. And so it just means that we have to become an employer, employer of choice. And I think any company that is not uh, is going to struggle. So especially uh, being in a, in a smaller city, San Antonio is a city of, of two million people. Um, our mayor is sitting to my left. Uh, we're in suits because we're traveling together uh, here on diplomatic matters. You don't but, work, usually wear a suit when no, I see I don't. you at the, uh, at the <laughs> I castle. I had to go find it. Um, but I think that, uh, that for whether you're in Silicon Valley or in San Antonio or in London, that if a company is not, uh, does not have a, an inspiring mission and is, does not treat its people well and is not part of a winning team, create a winning team, it becomes challenging to, to find the talent that it's needed. But I think if you're able to satisfy those things, um, I think doors open for you. I mean, here in London, we've been, Rackspace has been named to the Financial Times best place to work uh, many, many times. That is, I think, seven or eight, nine years in a row. And I think it's been really important, especially as a, as a U.S. company here with 850 uh, employees, we call them rackers. I mean, that is, we have a great presence here, but uh, we need to be able to make a name for ourselves here. Yeah. And Benjamin, uh, Benjamin Southworth, you helped build Tech City here. Right? I, I might be overstating that a bit, but you play a key role in the community here and getting the, the community here and the companies here known worldwide. Where do, where's your vision and, and where do you think where, where, you I know, gave, I contrast gave, yourself to, to Graham, I guess. I gave Ben my chair. <laughs> so he's trying to So I'm going to try and manage to sit down as a kind of core skill. Um, I, yeah, I think you've overstated the case. Uh, you know, Tech City is kind of, as a concept, built itself, right? So everyone in this room is, has, has done it. Um, all the government really tries to do is, is celebrate it and say, look, look at what we're doing, you know, um, and really kind of try to put London back on the map as, as a place where you can do internet-enabled business, you can do digital stuff. Um, so that's, you know, our, you know, the point about making a great place to work is kind of what we think about the community. 
I mean, we want all of you guys to be interacting with each other, communicating, celebrating, talking over the water cooler, saying like, if you see what that guy's doing, that's amazing. If you see what this guy's doing, that's amazing. And I think that's the kind of core of anything that's going to be fun. Like, I used to work at a, a, a great place called Jagex, and actually a former employee in the crowd. And we took that kind of vision of like, we've got to make this the best possible place to work. It's got to be the most fun that you've ever had. Like, it can't feel like work. It's just got to feel like this is the best day of my life and I get paid for it. And I take the same sort of approach about the community here, which is I want to try and give you guys, when you wake up, everything you can possibly have in order to build the best possible business. And we try very hard to do that. We're government, so that doesn't mean we're always the best people to do it, but we are trying to kind of give you as much sort of international shout outs and high fives as we possibly can. And I think if you guys can kind of do that internally, we can help kind of push that on an international stage. You said something very key there that uh, you want people to, to talk and impress their neighbor. And when I visit new places, or whether it's Tel Aviv or Berlin or here or Shanghai, I start networking with the people on the ground, down, down in the basement, and I ask them, what's hot here? And they almost always point to the same two or three companies and say, those are the hot companies, they're up and coming, right? Um, how do you get the companies to be those companies? How, how, do you, how do you get them to be impressive? Paul Graham today in a, a note that's on, on TechMeme sort of hinted at it, that he wants entrepreneurs to build products for themselves first and impress themselves and say this is awesome for me is that what it takes with so i guess there's two schools of thought right i mean you know there's 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 paul graham's methodology which is get yourself excited enjoy it build it and then you can keep driving yourself every day with like look at the cool thing i built there's obviously the lean startup methodology which is like build something that people will pay for i think either approach you should just enjoy it right you've got to you know, I kind of view coding now as a, as, as a sort of artisanal craft. Like, you have to really enjoy it. You have to wake up and be excited by refactoring code because it isn't interesting. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a fun gig. Like, it is quite tedious. It's very sort of, you know, detail-led. It requires quite a lot of focus and a lot of coffee and no one talks to you and you're kind of on your own and, you know, making sort of 3% CPU savings aren't, isn't very exciting. You're significant other isn't going to get that excited by you stopping a memory leak. Like, you have to enjoy it on, on a very deep personal level. And I think whatever you're building, you know, aim, aim to be proud of it. And if it doesn't make money, oh well, you built something you're proud of. Like, previously people wanted to be in a band and now they want to be in a startup. But you still need the same reason, which is just to go and do something you love that makes you happy, right? All the best bands in the world didn't work out how they could monetize their band. They didn't look at like A-B testing music. They just did something they liked and they saw if other people listened to it. And I think it's the same rule. You've just got to keep doing what makes you happy. Most tech ideas, if you kind of put them as an elevator pitch, you think about Twitter, text message for web, you would never ever think it would transform entire communities, that it would be a huge contributing factor to uh, democratization of the Arab world. Like, you wouldn't think that, but that's what happens. So just make sure your vision is kind of enjoyable, and then if you can make that big, then do that. Yeah. Julian, uh, you're the uh, up-and-coming mayor in America. You're, you're, you're the youngest mayor of a top 50 city in America, right? What, what does that youth bring to the table and, and help making uh, your city one that geeks want to move to and put their businesses in? Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you for the question. Sorry for being a little bit tardy. Um, yeah, so I'm the mayor of San Antonio, Texas, and uh, the proud uh, home of Rackspace. And uh, I think what it brings is, is an excitement uh, about new technologies and a willingness to support innovation. And also, I guess because of the, generally, being closer in age, a recognition of what a lot of folks who are in their 20s and early 30s uh, would find exciting. So uh, the question was asked earlier, you know, what can government do, for instance, to, to support uh, an environment that, that harnesses innovation and an environment where you can grow companies? One of the things that we're doing in San Antonio is investing tremendously in the urban core of our city. We have a performing arts center that's going up in 2014. The San Antonio Riverwalk is being expanded to 13 miles. Um, there are about 2,000 uh, 
apartment and condo units that are coming up in the downtown area over the next couple of years. And so we're trying to enliven the urban core of our city and, and attract an aggregation of, or support an aggregation of technology workers. This is really important. Uh, Alex, who runs uh, SoundCloud, said he went, he moved his company to Berlin because of the nightclubs that Berlin offers, right? <laughs> How many people here does that resonate with? <laughs> Would you uh, choose where to live because of the nightclubs? <laughs> There's a few people here. <laughs> and so having that kind of uh, activity and, and fun things to do at night and, uh, you know, after you code all day long and, and argue with your co-founder over what you should be doing, that's important, isn't it? It is important, uh, you know, to, to have just a tremendously livable city. And so we say that the vision for San Antonio is that we're trying to create a brain power community that is the liveliest city in the United States. And I think it's that liveliness, the vibrancy of the city um, uh, that, that adds a lot to the experience and is a draw to folks. And truth be told, San Antonio, you know, when people think about the United States, San Antonio is not the first place that you think of as the cool city or the hip city. In fact, in Texas, generally, that has been Austin. People think of Sixth Street in the University of Texas area. Well, you know, our goal is that in the next uh, few years to take the mantle of being the cool city away and have it there in San Antonio. And we're doing, we're making precise investments to accomplish that. So uh, several of the people I talked to before the panel started want to know how did they get their brand, their company, known worldwide? How, how do they build those partnerships, both with the business development guys to, to get the API access, but also the PR, the money, uh, the talent? How do they uh, play that, that quad uh, star, and how do they make their company really rock and roll? You've got to be memorable to be memorable. If you know, you, you've got to be able to communicate your vision. So, um, if you're a um, technology entrepreneur, um, any kind of entrepreneur, you have to have something to say, and you've got to be willing to share that vision with the world. And you've got to get out there on the road, and you, you know, can't be uh, regardless of whether you're tired or you're an introvert or you're overworked or you're, you, you know, your business is running out of cash. You've got to get out there and communicate the vision, because as most entrepreneurs will tell you, there's this thing called serendipity that takes care of a whole lot of stuff. It's the you know dinner party you almost didn't go to. It's the conference where you didn't look right but you looked left and you met the guy who's going to back your business or who told you about this or that. It's just you got to have enough conversations going to, and then you've got to be on the front foot and be really clear about what you're doing because one, you've got to learn something. Two, the other people who believe and share that vision, whether it's a product and company vision or a vision as, as I have for redefining the financing of entrepreneurship and making it really world class and saying, you know, the big problem actually in Europe is has nothing to do with the entrepreneurs. It has to do with the financiers of entrepreneurship have not kept pace with the high quality of entrepreneurs. So when I take that message to the road, what do you know? There's big money out there that wants to find other financiers of entrepreneurship to put their big money behind good entrepreneurs in, in Europe and the UK. So I would just say you've got to get out there. So there's, there's no shortcut for the hard work for doing that. And you become a better communicator over time. So if you think, well, I don't have that skill set. I'm just a geek. Wrong. You got to start somewhere. You know, it's just like you got to be a first time CEO. You got to be a first time communicator. Get out there and start practicing. Graham, build, buildings like this one are great places to practice that, right? And if you can't convince the 50 people downstairs right now that you're cool, how are you going to convince TechCrunch editors or uh, you know Sequoia to invest in you or whatnot like you did? And you started a geekdom, which is very similar to what's going on in this building, to do that, right? Yeah, I think uh, one of the best, uh, I think, examples of the new world is is my friend and Rackspace colleague, Robert Scoble, because one of the things that I love about you, Robert, first of all, it's always, always good to pander to the, uh, to, the, to, to the host, right? I mean, but I think Robert, Robert, you know, Robert has gotten to his prominence through substance and not through flash, but through substance in years and years of working, uh, you know, like water on stone, working um, not for fame, but trying to push your message and your ideas. And I think they're really the, and this has been not done, again, not through flashy sponsorships or through you know, diving off of uh, balloons. This has been done sort of the old-fashioned way of using modern tools and, and through really communicating your substance and your ideas in a, in, through new media. And I think that that's the exciting thing. These things don't take, um, I mean, President Obama did the same thing, a, a rack space, uh, a former racker, head of the Barack Obama's um, campaign. He was the CTO of the campaign. 
they found the same exact thing using social media tools, using the, the modern tools, but really executing simple, simple ideas and executing uh, that is communicating simple messages that people want to, want to hear about. So I don't think things have changed that much. What the, the channels have changed, but I think this, the, the idea that your substance and your message is what's going to prevail. Right, but you, you've, you've created spaces in, in uh, San Antonio where you can practice. And yes, you that's true. You, don't, you can in, impress the guy or girl sitting right next to you and code that in project too. And if you impress that person, then you, you impress another person and another person. And all of a sudden, everybody's like, hey, that, that thing is cool, right? Yeah, I, th I think actually, it, uh, yeah, in San Antonio, I've created a, a, an incubator called Geekdom. And it's a place where entrepreneurs and geeks can get together. And um, I think in ev nearly every week we have pitch practice. Um, we also run a, a startup incubator called Three Day Startup that, was, that is um, one of the projects of one of our co-founders. And I think this idea of pitching your ideas and pitching your business is something that really is central to getting your startup off the ground. It's absolutely central to it. And by having pitch practice routinely, it means that people need actually see it as one of the activities they need to be good at and it's something that they can come and rehearse and flub and get, uh, get feedback. Uh, I think it's one of the core new skills. Selling yourself and your ideas has always been important, but especially in the startup world, yeah. being able to uh, get buy-in from, you know, from the real, real world out there is critical. I've been in the room when Mike Arrington gets pitched, and, and sometimes they, they, they would say, uh, can I send you my press release? And I don't want a press release, I want your blog, i.e. Do the basics of you know talk to the world about your product. Put a blog up. Put a Facebook page. I have a list of 1,900 startups on a Facebook list. That list, and it's amazing how bad most of you guys are at explaining what you do. <laughs> you know, and you're getting free PR right there. You get on my list, and you get to talk to 4,000, 5,000 people right there by just putting up a post and a picture and a little video, right? And most of the startups are not doing that very well. Uh, I see this. The basics aren't being done. The, the blogging isn't being done. The YouTube videos are, you know, you, you, we all know the examples where it's done really well. But we uh, you can look at 100 examples where there is no video from a company, or it was done poorly, or it lacked, there wasn't much thought put into it, et cetera, et cetera. Give me some examples of, well, you're a, you're a politician. You've got to be great at this PR game, right? Because <laughs> you've got to talk people into voting some for you. Some days better than others. <laughs> so what, what kinds of tips do you have for getting your message out to the world? Well, I would say, and this is something that I have seen in, in many of the folks who are behind startups, entrepreneurs, is that people can tell when you have passion and when you authentically believe in what you're selling versus when you don't. And if I had to say that there's one thing that's more important than anything else that's a common denominator, whether you're in politics or you're pitching a startup, it's authenticity and the zeal, the passion that you show for it. Uh, and then after that, as you say, it's utilizing all the new tools that are out there. If you're hungry enough, whether you're in politics or you're trying to pitch your startup, you're going to find those avenues, find the ways, the channels that you can get to to get to the right people. So uh, I'd love to take questions. So if you, if anybody does have questions, I have yes. A question just about pitching generally, about um, just ask the panel about if they've got stories about when people pitch them and it's gone well or, or badly. I just, I just pitched uh, my idea to Robert just a few minutes ago. Yeah. Uh, did I do badly? No, you were, you were great because you were short, so say sure. I think you sure. Absolutely. If you can't explain your idea in one minute, you're dead. I, you know, uh, uh, Saeed, who runs Plug and Play, he has, I don't know, 400 startups in one building in Sunnyvale. He says he funded somebody for $300,000 in the elevator on the way down. So by the time they got to the bottom floor, he funded them. He goes, that's what I'm looking for. How can you have that passion, that clarity of thought, and that understanding of where you're going in the world? If you do that, you come, you, you're ahead of uh, at least 30% of the other startups out there, right? Uh, any other tips? Just, I, I think you have to th you genuinely believe that you're bringing somebody an opportunity and, that, and, f and figuring out how to make it in their interest, right? So appeal to people that can add to it. So, you, you know, I'm fascinated by this and, you know, I'm bringing it to Thomas because I think Thomas knows something about it and Thomas can help me with that. And so you treat people not as, you don't want them to think of you as a supplicant for cash, but you want them to think of, I brought you an opportunity and I want you to be some sort of partner in my journey. And that's why I'm talking to you. And, and, and then you just got to say it with a lot of, um, you know, 
confidence. I think also one of the ways that small businesses can beat big ones is because of their belief and the inspiration that they get from what they're doing. It's so hard. One of the key ingredients uh, of a successful startup is that you that the entrepreneur has to be totally confident that they're going to prevail, and yet totally accept the fact that they may not. And this creates a tremendous anxiety that um, that really fuels uh, fuels your success. If you're not able to tap into that anxiety and bring power to the table uh, and conviction to the table. I mean, you're just not going to succeed. And so I think that every big business is threatened by the small one because of the passion, the will to succeed, but also the anxiety uh, that lies behind every entrepreneur about whether there's someday they'll be presenting, they'll be telling their parents or their friends that they've actually not succeeded. And that, I think that fear is something that, that big businesses can't really replicate. That is, you can't replicate whether Google's going to go out of business tomorrow if you don't succeed in your project. or. That is, that once you're in a big company that's secure, that anxiety, I think, dissipates. And I think this, is give, this gives small companies an edge, gives them a, a way in. Um, go back to when you created Rackspace with two other guys, at least. Um, tell me about a bad day, and tell me about a good day. We, have, we manage over 90,000 servers today. And, and uh, when we hit 100 servers, uh, we were on a, the founders and I were on a trip, uh, trip in New York. And we got this phone call. We'd hit 100 servers, and it was just absolutely one of the most breathtaking days. And each server paid us about $500 a month, and so that means that we were 500 a month. That's 5,000. That's 50,000 a month. That's 600,000 dollars. 600,000 dollars a year in business. And I just remember being so thrilled about that we reached that milestone in about eight weeks. And just to think of the future that lay ahead if we could continue that. Um, but then competition, you know, being at the right place at the right time is really nice. It's really nice. It's hard to duplicate. The trouble is, is that other people are there with you. And so every single day, a new competitor that was more, deep, more heavily funded than we were came online. Uh, the, uh, and I just remember, specifically, a company called The Planet um, had uh, seemed to have all the advantages. They had better board members. They had better funding. They had uh, really a better proximity. Uh, and um, anyway, I just remember really going home wondering whether we could do it. Europe and the world is being squeezed economically, and you survived two downturns. How did you do that? Well, I think um, we, were, we were about to go public during uh, 2000, and I think we would have been the first floated business that still used QuickBooks for accounting. <laughs> <laughs> and so it would have been a real disaster. To, uh, if we had floated at that time. And so the first downturn really caused us to, uh, you know, when, when, the, when we were not going to get money from the magic public markets, it really forced us to get the business profitable uh, quickly. And, the, and so while most of our dot-com brethren had lots of money in their pocket and they were still burning money, we had pulled back and made ourselves profitable. And that was really critical. Um, we were on the right side of the, of the, of the bubble in that case. Um, another was a year later, um, we had a, an offer to sell the company that we were prepared to take. And on 9-11, uh, we were set to actually do the deal on 9-11. And fortunately for us, um, it is terrible for the rest of New York and America, and 9-11 stopped that deal. So that was a, uh, and this is, that's why Rackspace is an independent company today. And so, you know, those were both seminal moments in our history. Um, and I think even after 9-11, we had to pick ourselves up and say, okay, deal's not going to happen. Maybe the sprint is a marathon after all. And, and committing to that idea, the idea that you're here really building a company for the long term. We, when we uh, talk about funding, we talk about smart money. You know, there's, there's just money and there's smart money. And you can talk about that with Sequoia. And what do you bring to the table and how do you help entrepreneurs leap out of London and go worldwide? Every entrepreneur, every investor, um, I think most of them will at least want to think of themselves as smart money. But I think we, what we're doing at Ariadne Capital is a kind of much more revolutionary approach. We actually think the entrepreneur is our customer. And I guarantee you that most venture firms don't think that the entrepreneur is their customer. Um, they typically want to prove that they're the smartest guy in the room. And they kind of fail to understand this 
I think, historical uh, truism that capital follows ideas, right? We don't remember Queen Isabella, we remember Christopher Columbus, right? It wasn't the Medici family, it was Michelangelo who painted the Sistine Chapel. So in the, in the kind of global historical, you know, scope of things, we're, we're about finding that guy or that woman who's going to, again, bring that future to the present. And I think that's really important because what Graham said earlier, it's about belief. And before you have the early adopters, you've got to have the early believers. And one thing that I know that I've given to the entrepreneurs that, I mean, we were early advisors to Skype. I mentioned Monetize, Spinbox, eSpotting, said Bishop. Uh, so we'll beat that quote to Google. I know very well that the first thing that any of those entrepreneurs would say about the work that Ariadne did with them is say, you believed when nobody else would. When we couldn't get an appointment in Mayfair with the Black Marbled Office venture capital community, thank God you just you know didn't treat us like shit. And uh, this you know strange concept that you have of sending us progress reports weekly about what you're doing, how novel. We you know we go into rooms and we're like treated like you know you know what from arrogant VCs. So I think the first thing is belief. The second thing is belief, and probably the third thing is belief. And then after that, it's kind of saying, okay, what do we need to do to go over the hill? So either you're you're there and you're there to support the entrepreneur. Um, it doesn't mean that you're not tough. And if they start to you know if they miss milestones or um, or if they lie to you but overall you're backing the entrepreneur and you actually want the strongest entrepreneur not the one that you can keep under your thumb not to replace them you know and I for those of you who know Brent Hoberman, he was the first entrepreneur I worked with when I came to the United Kingdom I helped him put his first round of funding together and I remember coming out of venture meetings when um, the esteemed venture capital community of 1998 would say things like, hey, Brent, when are you going to get a real CEO to run the business? And on the way out the door, he would say, you know, Julie, just take their name off the list, and when we sell the company or it goes public, would you please remind me to send them the press release, you know? So you got to you gotta have the hood spot to say, I am the CEO, right? And I'm it. You're backing me. And, and I think just recognizing that kind of order of things is part of what we do. So Julian and Ben... Uh, you know, most entrepreneurs, when you sit down with them, they don't want to deal with government. Government to them, to many geeks, is a hindrance. It's something that uh, we have to deal with when we need a permit or something like that. Why should we come and see you and partner with you? What, what do you bring to the table and help entrepreneurs in this worldwide uh, global system? I thought we both just played. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's a great question. It's a great question. but. Um, uh, my reasoning and rationale is to have a government, especially the UK government, understand that there is a revolution that is occurring in East London, right here, right now, and to say, you know what, we're going to put 10 people whose day in, day out job is to help you, is kind of amazing. Like, that's never happened in any sort of uh, growth industry anywhere. Life science has been around for ages, cloned a sheep has only now just got the same organization that you guys have had for 18 months coming up for two years. And that's really rare. You know, the government itself talked to Eric Schmidt and brought campus here and said, we want you to bring it here. And I think it's understandable as a hacker and a geek to myself, it's understandable to be reticent about what can we do for you. But the fact that we are attempting to do something is a huge difference of mindset than letting you just go free and kind of ignoring the fact that this is happening. The fact that they've even given someone like me with this beard a job is kind of amazing. But also, you have someone like yourselves, if I can say that, actually turning around to government going, you need to be better at this stuff. This is the stuff you don't get. You haven't heard about this startup. You haven't seen that you can take all your Excel spreadsheets, stick it in a Dropbox and produce an API. Let's report better. Let's do better things. Let's make government more techy. So it kind of works both ways, right? The hacker mentality which you guys espouse, I'm trying to push back at government and saying, look, let's be more efficient. Let's be smarter. Let's play this game differently. In return, I'm coming back to you guys going, okay, like, look, we understand the IPO market in the UK isn't as good as it should be. We are working on it. And that goes through a huge process, and yes, it takes time, and government is not a startup. But the fact that they are even willing to engage with us is a huge, huge deal. The fact that San Antonio is wishing to encourage people, 
can only underscore the excitement of what is actually happening right now on a worldwide scale. You know, like, let's be happy about this, right? Let's be really excited and be like, wow, you know what? Maybe in 15, 20 years, our kids are going to understand how an iPad works from the age of six and understand how to build brilliant, brilliant companies like Rackspace. Like, that's amazing. That's a sea change. That's not go to school, kind of learn some stuff, and then afterwards discover there's loads of exciting things in the world that you didn't hear about. We can make a real transformation happen. So I think that's why government should help, because we're all right. We're not that bad. <laughs> that's, it. that's very well said. And it, it's, it's true that over the years, uh, that I would imagine, unless you're in a place like Silicon Valley, that, that the local governments were not too savvy about the particular needs of 21st century sectors. Uh, and I do think the governments have gotten a lot better, uh, both in their own organization and then linking up to the needs of entrepreneurs. Uh, and, and, and what folks should know is that there, there is a strong desire on the part of local governments to be particularly helpful uh, to entrepreneurs like you because we do get that y'all are often the ones that create exciting new companies and ones that pay very well on the whole and that require a skilled workforce, require brain power, exactly the types of industries that are going to determine whether communities thrive in the 21st century. So there's a, really, a real willingness to work with you, even if uh, governments have sometimes been slow to adapt. So um, I'm going to just challenge the kind of question just a bit, and you're probably going to wish that I didn't join the panel. But um, I think we're moving from an era of, you could refer to it as collective exchange to reciprocal exchange. And the kind of infrastructure of democracy, aka government, hasn't changed for about 500 years. And I think it seriously needs to be redefined. So I'm glad that there's a willingness to do that, because I think pretty rapidly, I mean, within the next five years, we're going to have people using Freedom of Information Act to demand not this this kind of, you know, let's put a little bit of government transactions and data and what happened to all of our tax money on the web. But I think it's going to be, you know, complete, you know, and we're going to be able to see everything. And when the, this group of people who fight so hard to get a million pounds of funding into your startup, I think you're going to be shocked when you see how unhard government spends that million pounds. And I just I throw that out as a challenge, not because government's you know bad people, quite the contrary. I think we just all need a poke when we're going in the wrong direction. And I see people who are fighting so hard to make money and to put money in. And I think that we just have a different culture, which is different than the startup community that we live and breathe, about spending our money. And let's not forget, it is our money. We give government the right to tax us. It is not their money. We give them the right to tax us so we can demand to know where that money goes and what it's spent on. And in a world which is moving so rapidly from collective exchange to reciprocal exchange, where we can handle that reciprocal exchange ourselves, you got to ask the question, why do we need the people who organize the collective exchange in the first place? There's a real opportunity for government to reinvent its role. I would just say in response to that that I agree with a lot of that. I would also put a challenge out to you all, though. Uh, as somebody who is in politics, one of the things that I often see is that people who are in technology or in medicine or in business don't want to have anything to do with government. You know, they want to, a lot of times, they want to wash their hands of, of being involved in, in whether it's local politics or other types of government. You guys can improve government with what you're doing and what you know. And I, and I would challenge folks to be more involved because you have a lot to give to self-governance that a lot of times you just don't get from the people that are going into it and representing folks right now. So it's a kind of a two-way street. Yeah. Any other questions? We, we're uh, coming to a close here. Yeah. yeah. Um, just on uh, what Julie was saying about the venture capital investors in London, the investor community. Um, I uh, had a couple of startups and I found it pretty difficult to engage with the people with the money in London. Right? There's a lot of money here and lots of private capital, um, more than almost any other city on the planet. And um, despite schemes like SEIS, um, there's just very little visibility of um, opportunities to, to invest in smart young people. So like, what can we do, either as a community or more on the government side of things um, to stimulate that, because I think that would unlock an extremely powerful um, exchange of capital and ideas. 
what, one of the things that happened in the downturn is a kind of private debt market, you know, kicked into gear, and that when that private debt then converts, so you know, people couldn't get money from wherever that you know, from customers, from investors, so people would lend them money which hurts your balance sheet, but then you don't get the EIS tax treatment if you finally get them to convert into equity. So one really good thing that the government can do is to just accept that that has happened and to apply EIS tax incentives to the private debt that occurred over a period of five years and to give those same tax incentives to people, right? Because that's that's just a you know that's just a reality and so forth. And I think it comes back to the, the media as well. Just I think if we could just get more articles out there, front page stories of our national business publications and so forth that are talking about the guys because you're you're right, the United Kingdom has a hell of a lot of money. And I think the data set is wrong in the venture community. Actually it's people in the family offices and the angel investors that have taken the punts and making the money. It's just not necessarily getting captured by the BBCA, the British Venture Capital Association. And so we need to really work hard on that, communicating the fact that how many exits, how many people are making money out of this and so forth. It's like this great, well-kept secret. People are making a lot of money by backing technology startups. Graham, you, your family came out of, out of England, right, and was entrepreneurial for a long time. Do you feel a uh, uh, a need to give back, to invest in the next up and coming startups and, and use your wealth to do that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are a bunch of reasons to invest in startups. One is because it's just plain old exciting. And if it's not exciting, you, you're going to, your tolerance for the risk that you're taking, you know, just, you're not going to make an investment. So if it's not exciting, you don't have this ability to sort of disbelieve that your, your company can fail, right? And um, it's just sort of like where they have young people and, and go to war. You know, it's, there's a little risk, uh, suspension of risk belief. You know, and and secondly is that I think that investors want to be part of something. They want to be a member of something special. Um, and when, I, which I think both both of those issues, making it exciting and making your startup something special, uh, is really the founder's job. So founder's job to go sell those ideas to investors. The third one is, I think, is role models. Um, we, our investors made 150 times their money, and there's nothing like that to make them crack open their wallets the next time. You know, if you bring success stories to the city of London, you're going to see more and more money come out of wallets. You'll also see founders and people who were part of startups see it as possible. Just believing that it can happen to you, that it can it is possible, that it's a good risk to take, is really the beginning. You know, I really, I have this theory that, that um, MBA schools, for the most part, destroy more startups than they create. And now, it's not because they're running these companies, but it's because by the time an MBA uh, gets through uh, a school, they have debt, and also they can sell, sell their, themselves for more money to, uh, to, a, to a real big business. So this actually makes the opportunity cost of working for a startup much, much harder to bear. So I think this means that the core infrastructure of education in our society, um, in America and in, and in the UK, really, for the most part, discourages entrepreneurship. And so to me, that's a problem. When you think about the entrepreneurs who are the ones that are creating 90% of the jobs uh, in the American economy, um, you know, how do you have a, a, structural, a structure of education that actually diminishes entrepreneurship? So I think that government, I mean, to that example, um, government can play a real role uh, in, as a leadership, uh, in using their leadership platform to say, you see this entrepreneur, with, see what they're doing over here, they created 50 jobs, that's good, we want more of it. Anyone else out there want to try? That is to me when government says that, that being a, a startup capitalist is, is a good thing, people will follow their lead. Um, that is, I, I really think that, uh, uh, again, if, if, you, uh, if you tell your parents you're going to start a startup versus uh, go into banking, what do they first think? They think you're crazy. So you have to have a lot of, uh, a lot of will and gumption and belief that, that risk is actually worth taking. And for the most part, the risk is probably risk adjusted. You probably are better off uh, going into banking. But you, so that's why belief is so important. Just believing that that's not what's right for your life and wanting to actually put, put yourself on the map in a substantive way, that, that is, that's the reason to take the crazy risks. Any other questions? Yeah. Hi, question for Julia. <coughs> um, recently read your book, and um, Thank what, you. yeah, one of the questions, one of the statements you make is that um, you got to a point where you said you, you stopped thinking about money as much, and you started focusing on three things. One of them was um, building your unfair advantage, 
what advice would you give to the room about how we should go about building <coughs> our unfair advantage yeah. and spreading our message? How do you build an unfair advantage? So the, the point that I made in the book, and I think it's a bigger issue than just entrepreneurs, but I think just in general, I think there's such a fierce, fierce urgency of helping young people coming through think and learn how to act entrepreneurially. Because in the extremely uncertain world that we're living in, the only thing that you can rely on is your ability, just like entrepreneurs do, to figure it out on the fly. There's no one job, it's not one employer, there's about 17 doors you can go through and you're going to have to deal with all of that. And I, I realize that what I had, the way that I've been kind of socialized in my um, upbringing and my education was to fix my uh, weaknesses as opposed to building on my strengths. And even once I could identify my strengths, I wanted to have different strengths. Could I please have different ones? I don't like those. And then I started to realize, um, after I sold my first business, that what my unfair advantage was. And that led me, then it triggered this, this understanding of what I am here to do, my unique contribution. And I think if we can map the, the market, the opportunities are tied to the uncertainty. But if we really believe that each one of us has a unique contribution that we're meant to, to to, to give, to deliver, to execute in the world. Um, and, and for me, that's just about um, thinking hard and eliminating noise, eliminating negativity, staying focused on that, and, um, and, and to not, you know, to, I, I kind of asked everybody else their opinion about what I should do, but I hadn't built that kind of muscle internally to say, this is what you're here to do, and so forth. So it just took me a longer time. Instead of at 34, if I figured it out at 17, so I just kind of, you know, I'm trying to help the 17 year olds not take so long to figure it out. Thank you. Grant, what did you do to, to get your company money and PR? Because that's that kept coming up in conversations before uh, the panel. Was it, you were in San Antonio. It was the middle of nowhere, <laughs> technology-wise, right? Um, well, I think that Rackspace, uh, we decided very early on that we were in a space that was that was generally very, had very poor reputation. and. Uh, one reason was because we were just as bad as everybody else. Uh, it's true, and we just decided how in the world can we ever stand out from the crowd in this enormously crowded and and uh, and low caliber uh, marketplace. And we we had to deliberately turn change our company strategy 180 degrees and see what we call fanatical support as as what would be our reason for being. And so. We really, uh, it started out as an aspiration and ultimately became, it's hard to fulfill. Uh, but you know, over time, we, we continue to focus on how do we deliver fanatical support? What if a company actually did? What would they do? And I think after, you know, I think this became the idea that a tech company would have, uh, would be trustworthy or would, would have great support. I think it was a whole new idea. We did a bunch of crazy things like we answered the telephone, uh, ways to communicate that we were trying to be trying to be different and that we were going to have a sense of accountability that our rest of our industry didn't have. And I think that once we figured out that, that really that was going to be how we became famous, um, the rest of it became kind of simple because we, we, knew, within, we knew how to make decisions within the company uh, with this as the lens. And it also meant that when we went out to, uh, to the press, we would talk about the different, different ways that we were bringing fanatical support to life. And, and these are, you know, I think sometimes the things that are hardest are the places where competitive advantage is created. Things that are easy are easily copied. And the harder it was for us to do, you know, it's really hard when your entire business is, is really delivered at the front lines. Uh, how do you control every single interaction? How do you make your people go above and beyond? And this became our challenge, which is how do we create a company of volunteers? And this became an interesting question for for uh, articles and for press, and it just sort of made us, uh, you know, brought us to life. Um, you know, most web businesses uh, don't have the ability to bring themselves to that, and I think that those who can have a real advantage. <coughs> Julie, we, you know, before these guys walked in, we were starting to talk about the story, and that hits on it. Having a great story to tell really sets you apart, right? What other tricks do you do to find that story and make sure your story is better than the other guys. Well, yeah, you know, I think there's a lot to be said for stealing other people's ideas. You know, you pick a little bit up along the way, you hear people and you say, you know, that triggers something here. So you, you accumulate and aggregate and integrate ideas and so forth. So all the more reason to get out and to share your ideas because 
everything is about aggregation and you kind of massage the idea until you get your story and it kind of works. So um, you don't wake up one day, I think, with the right story, with the right product, with the right whatever. It's an iterative product. You're not telling them what they wanted to hear, which was you just walk in the middle of the road and like, magic happens yeah. and you don't have to prepare too much. <laughs> right? Everybody has that dream that I don't have to work too hard and I'll become Instagram, right? No, but I, I, you know, I think you mentioned Sound Hill Road, you know, who would have thought even five years ago, people would say, oh, you know, those, the, that venture group there on Sound Hill Road is kind of all baked. Nobody could become, you know, the number one VC, it's one of the ones that's there, right? Nobody would have said, even the founder of Netscape, Mark Andreessen, that Andreessen Horowitz because, would create a story they could take to the market to raise billions to become the number one VC in Silicon Valley. He didn't do that just because he's the founder of Netscape. He had a story about the financing of entrepreneurship that enabled him in you know, kind of less than five years kind of dethrone and become the number one VC in Silicon Valley. So you do that by telling a story and I'm sure he thought about it for all those years that he was raising money and building companies to understand you know what the story would be down the line and I think also you know in the book you understand things much later the stuff you did in your early 20s helps you when you're in your mid 40s you just you know it's all building the story builds and it's really a question of if you're going to pull it out or if you're not going to listen to yourself and if you spend time you know, as I say in the book, watching bad TV and talking to people you don't like, you don't figure out your story. Any other questions? Yeah, we have one in the back. Hi. Back to your, your comments around government. Um, there's about 13 people here from South Africa at Cape Town. And well, the government gets a lot of bad press with regards to mining and other industries. But we've been funded to come over here and meet for a year and listen to those awesome comments. So I'd just like to give a big up to our South Africa. So we're doing something right. <laughs> Mining might be a dirty business, but everybody likes their iPhone, which had a lot of weird stuff that came out of the ground. In it, right? Actually, I think the, the most important resource that South Africa has is not the mines, it's South Africans. We've, Rackspace has had an absolute phenomenal uh, experience with the South Africans, so welcome. Um, Robert, um, Britain obsesses with its sort of lack of big companies. It's often, often kind of, we're always talking about our lack of billion dollar companies. Autonomy was sold to HP for $11 billion in May this year. Um, That's a lot of billions. They went to HP's results it's a lot today, of, they wish they didn't. Oh, uh, yes, they did. And they, <laughs> they, wrote, they wrote down $8.8 billion, which is the price of your value of your company now today, with a $5 billion allegation of fraud in that deal. Yeah. How do you think that's going to affect American companies when they come looking at UK tech businesses? Well, you know, we've, we've sold companies, like I said, beat that quote to Google last year. You know, there's something wrong with a, a venture model, which seems to be the implicit um, assumption is you invest in stuff and sell it to American technology companies. I didn't come here and I didn't get into venture capital to just keep on selling stuff to Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Apple. It seems like a really flawed thesis. So if part of what we need to do to build the entrepreneurial ecosystem that I think we all, you know, we, we can do, is we have to recognize that so many things in Europe are not going to conform to the way it is in the venture community here across 25 countries is not going to conform to 50 states in the US and so forth. And we have to have the courage to say, take out a clean sheet of paper. What do we need to do to help what I was talking about earlier, those large European companies with massive amounts of customers. It might be N Brown with six million you know, catalog customers, but for God's sakes, they need digital technology too, right? And there, I think there are partnerships that can bring revenue and create, let's create the dynasty businesses and not sell. If there's nothing wrong with just saying, and, I, and we, gotta, we gotta work on this so that we don't just build something in order to sell it, but we build dynasty businesses. And I love the moment when Alistair at Monosai said to me three years ago, he said, I'm so tired, Julie, I gotta sell the business. And today he says, there's not enough money to get me to sell Monetize to anyone, right? 11 billion? No, but that's what, no, the point is, is just that there's got to be another way for that entrepreneur to take cash off the table. It's a listed company now, but you know, you know what I'm saying here. It's just that the model is build, invest in it, sell it to a U.S. tech firm. As long as we do that, we're not going to become number one or get the next ground zero of disruptive technology in Europe. I don't want to keep pulling Graham in, but Graham, you, you had a conversation with Tony Shea who uh, started Zappos, and Tony told me, I asked Tony, why do you work so hard on culture? 
because in Zappos he worked so hard to make sure really that he didn't hire assholes in his culture. I mean, that's really what it is. And I asked him, why did he do that? He said, in, because in my past company, when I built my earlier company, I hired people because I thought I should hire them based on their pedigree. I didn't hire them because they were nice or that I would want to work with them every day. Maybe all of, all of you, because you work with people, you work with people, you work with people. You know, how do you build a culture that will last? So. I'm half British, so I've been coming here my whole life, and I feel very much at home here. And I, the first uh, non-US country that I wanted to bring Rackspace to was was UK. So I'm among friends. Okay, I want UK to succeed. Rackspace has been tremendously beneficial. We a quarter of our business is here in UK. Before we actually launched an office here, I went to visit. I got the, the some of the magazines and. I uh, looked at in the back of the magazine for the hosting companies and I actually went to visit almost every hosting company that existed in 2002 here in, here in England and uh, one in Scotland. And many of those companies uh, did sell to not just American companies but German companies and uh, French companies. And you know, one of the reasons why we end up the largest, uh, largest hosting company in, in England is because they, they uh, cut out early. Okay. Now, a lot of them made a lot of money, um, made a lot of money, but I think that there is definitely a, an attitude or a perspective that, um, that, that short-term thinking, the idea that, that as soon as you make something worth something, you're going to sell it. I think that's very damaging. It, I think companies are not built as well uh, when you have this outlook, and also many British companies don't fulfill their promise. I mean, I, one of my favorite examples here in the UK is uh, there's an entrepreneur named Andrew Michael. Andrew Michael built a company called Fast Hosts. They're, they still compete with Rackspace today, but they're now owned by the Germans. And, and really, I think that the company has, has, not, has not thrived uh, since he sold it. And I know that he's kicking himself uh, for having done so. I think the tantalizing thing is that, that there's, there are exits available at really all stages in a company's life if they're successful. And it's, sometimes it's, uh, it's hard to it's hard to resist those exits, but realize that there's one, if you're successful, there's going to be one a year later. There's going to be one a year later. There's going to be one a year later. The multiple may be higher or lower, but if you build something valuable, that is, don't think that that exit opportunity is once in a lifetime. And I think that that's often how exits are seen. Um, and I think that's probably with autonomy. Autonomy, let's not forget that autonomy got a heck of a price. So I think the net, there was a net positive for Britain on that deal. Um, so I think there are times where if you can find a fool of a buyer, they, you know, you, maybe, uh, maybe you could sell it. Uh, the trouble is the companies are also uh, <laughs> the people. Do those people really uh, want to go to this new, uh, go to HP? I don't know. I doubt it. But I think that, you know, let's, I, would, I don't cry too much about autonomy because I really think that, that the, the Brits got uh, the better half of that deal. But I think for the most part, uh, autonomy, I think, became as valuable as it was because it was built to last. It was a company built to last, and the question is, will it last under under their new ownership? We have to wrap up. This has been a great panel. Thank you so much to everybody for uh, joining us, and I, I really appreciate it. I hope everybody here appreciate it. It was really fascinating. <laughs>
with us, you can run our software in your own premises for free. So it's really, I think, um, we're glad to be bringing this, this startup program to, uh, to the UK. It's been very successful in the US. We love startups. Um, even though Rackspace hosts for, uh, for half the, the FTSE 50 today, uh, we really have startups in our heart. And we want, to be, we want this program to uh, give special opportunities to uh, young startups with opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.